Welcome to the Gooder Podcast, where we talk with powerhouse women in CPG about their journeys to success. This episode is sponsored by Retail Voodoo, a brand development firm guiding mission-driven consumer brands to attract new and passionate consumer base, crush their categories through growth and innovation, and magnify their social and environmental impact. If your brand is in need of brand positioning, package design, or marketing activation, we are here to help. You can find more information at www.retail-voodoo.com. Well, hi, Diana Freik here. I am the host of the Gooder Podcast, where I get to talk with the powerhouse women in the food, beverage, and wellness categories about their journeys to success and their insights on the industry. This episode is brought to you by Retail Voodoo. Retail Voodoo is a brand development firm. Our clients include Starbucks, Kind, REI, PepsiCo, Heike, and many other market leaders. We provide strategic brand and design services for brands in the food, wellness, beverage, and fitness industries. So if your goal is to increase market share, drive growth, or disrupt the marketplace with new and innovative ideas, give us a call and let's talk. Or visit retail-voodoo.com for more information. Now, today's guest, somebody I'm very, very excited to introduce you to, as a p- founding team member of Snack Futures Mondelez International's Innovation and Venture Hub, Katrina Borischuk is thrilled to have the opportunity to align her work with her personal passions for creating delicious food and helping people to live healthier lives. She is an entrepreneurial co-founder of Dirt Kitchen Snacks, which is on a mission to help people get more veggies into their lives by making real, recognizable veggies into delicious snacks. Katrina has been with Mondelez International for nine and a half years and is precursor Kraft Foods for 6.5 years, having served as Director of Global Innovation for the Gum and Biscuits categories, Director of Global Kid Wholesome Biscuits brand equity and strategy, and various brand management roles in the U.S., including Ritz Crackers and Plant Nutrition. Prior to joining the food industry, Katrina worked in investment banking for Bear Stearns and Company and Barnett and Partners LLC in New York. Well, welcome, Katrina. How are you today? I am great. How are you? I am okay. I had a lot of words coming out of my mouth there <laughs> during your intro. You've been up to a lot. I, I, I just love it. Yes. Uh, you're on the East Coast. Is that right? Yes, I am. I'm in Jersey City today. Mm-hmm. Jersey City. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, you and I met on Expo at Expo this year, which was um, a pretty crazy show to return back to what in this whole trade show world. Did you happen to go to Sweets and Snacks that was just this last week? I did not. No, you I did not. not go to Sweets and Snacks. Okay. Bridget went. Um, our snack oh, she teachers, did. fearless mm-hmm. leader. Yeah, she went. I went a couple, a few years ago, I guess the last time they had it, um, but we mm-hmm. decided to divide and conquer. I was actually gotcha. out doing store visits in California earlier this mm-hmm. week. So mm-hmm. I did not go to Sweets mm-hmm. and Snacks. Important store visits too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll talk about that a yes. little bit more. Yes. Uh, I did sweets and snacks last year when it was in Indianapolis and that it was a really quiet show, but really active, meaning nice. all the booths that, uh, that were there had lots of great conversations. So I'm really hoping that Bridget had that experience or the team that she took with her had that experience in Chicago this last week. I hope so too. I have not gotten the download from her yet. Not so yet. Okay. I'm yeah. sure you will. Uh, yeah. Cause it's like just <laughs> wrapping up. So she's probably in a coma, I'm sure somewhere trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get everything back to back yeah. to home base. Okay. Well, Hey, I love it when brand owners get to tell us about their brand. Now um, you are part of the Mondelez snack features team, but your baby right now is dirt kitchen. Can you tell us a little bit about dirt kitchen and why it exists? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dirt Kitchen, as you mentioned in the um, in my bio, is we're on a mission to help people get more veggies into their lives. And that's mm-hmm. actually why we started. Mm-hmm. We had an insight that um, everyone's trying to eat more veggies. Actually, we, we did a survey and found out that 91% of American adults would agree that they're trying to get more veggies into their life. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the CDC says only 10% of American adults actually eat enough veggies every day. So there's a huge veggie problem that, yeah. that American adults have. And we learned that the reason people want to help eat more veggies is because it helps them meet health goals, either short-term or long-term health goals. But hmm it's hard, right? There's a mm-hmm. lot of barriers to veggies. And in particular, when it comes to snacking, they just don't offer the taste or excitement factor or convenience that people are looking for in a snack. So they weren't even really thinking about veggies for a snack. Like carrot sticks and celery sticks are wonderful, but they get a little boring if little. you have them too many days in a row. So <laughs> um, when we learned that insight, we that kind of became our North Star of how mm-hmm. do we make real veggies into delicious snacks? Um, so we came up with actually three, at this point, three different ways to do that. Um, okay. Our original offering was hey, is, um, oh. what we call, it's air-dried veggies and nut mixes. So mm-hmm. they are kind of like a savory trail mix a little bit, Ooh. flavor forward. They're actually inspired by culinary side dishes. This is not the OG. The OG is green beans and almonds with garlic, right. lemon, and sea salt, which is inspired by green bean almondine, which is a side dish that my family cooks at like every holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, this is zucchini chickpea pistachio, which was sort of inspired by Mediterranean cuisine. Um, and then we have another one that um, we're actually working on reformulation right now. Um, I see. Which is, um, it's now going to be carrot, zucchini, and cashews with spicy chili oh. lime. So kind of inspired by Thai salads. Interesting. Um, so that's the veggies and nuts. And that's the product line that we originally developed and did sort of the validation on the brand um, uh-huh. and validated sort of created the brand against that product bundle and sort of validated the whole bundle. Um, and then we brought in air dried veggie crisps, which are simply seasoned real veggies. So these are zucchini. Oh, the mm. light's doing weird things. Yeah. To the oh, packaging. There you go. Oh, um, good. Zucchini yeah. with extra virgin olive oil and sea salt. Mm -hmm. Um, and a little bit of black pepper. So just simply seasoned, like Mm -hmm. you might cook veggies in your kitchen on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Um, And then our third creation, which is new, and we just finished a test and learn, and we're in the process of making some little tweaks now, um, is what we call pressed bars. So these are veggies, fruit, nuts, and seeds pressed together. We have a proprietary technology that allows us to hold everything together without the use of a binder. So no binders, no added sugar. so a bit more of what we call swavery. So they're not sweet. They're not savory. They're a little bit in between swavery. Yes. Um, the entire brand. Yeah, I love that word. I did not invent that word, by the way. <laughs> well, fabulous woman in Mondelez R&D said that word to me years ago. And I was like, I'm taking that word because I really that. like it. Um, everything is... Um, no artificial flavors, colors, preservatives, no added sugar, gluten-free, vegan, non-GMO. We're just trying to make real veggies into like clean, delicious snacks as best as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, what we found is that consumers, particularly more health-oriented consumers, just really want to snack on real food. They don't Mm -hmm. want the processed stuff. They don't want the added sugars. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, creating a a snack out of real veggies that can satisfy your crunch craving in the afternoon or that can go on a hike with you, Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting over those convenience barriers of fresh veggies that you don't have to prep and that really delights you. Not only is is a nutritious, good for you snack, but also delights you and and satisfies those emotional needs that we have when we snack, like, you know, satisfying cravings or lifting up our mood, Mm -hmm. um, giving us a little bit of a break. So that is Dirt Kitchen Snacks. that is baby, and I'm kitchen. super proud of it. Well, so now, of course, none of y'all would know this, but um, this is Katrina's and I's take two of this recording because the first take one disappeared. We won't go into how it disappeared, but when we spoke last time, the the bars were just about ready. So now I get to see them in the real real. But the bars, I think, are going someplace. Special. Yeah, yeah, everything is. Yeah. So the whole line um, is actually in Sprout stores nationally um, uh-huh. for the next couple months. So we have a phenomenal opportunity. We're part of the innovation tables, as they call them. So oh, there's like, and mm. most Sprout stores, they have like a big kind of multi tiered table, right? Gotcha. By, either by the entrance to the store or by produce in the middle of the store that yeah. they've mm-hmm. got signage on it, like new for you. Um, so we have the opportunity to be part of that for a couple months. And then if we do well, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to move to the shelf um, more permanently. So all three, the crisps, the veggies and nuts, and the bars are actually on those displays um, all together. 
Okay. Well, that's, I think that's really, I think what I love about that is like the consumers get to kind of vote with their dollars, but they get to vote with their dollars by way of like, there's a little special place. I don't know what other retailers might be doing something like that, where it's, where they're bringing in new product and it's in a centralized location. I kind of like that. That's yeah, pretty smart. It's cool. It's really cool. And actually, you know, walking the stores earlier this week, it, it's the other fun thing about it is like, oh, I met that brand at Expo. That's pretty cool. They're on it too. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> it was fun. I know. So I, my husband thinks I'm nuts, at, at, right? But anybody that works in CPG, all y'all that listen that work in CPG, whether you're a retailer, distributor, or manufacturer, probably do the same thing. If you are responsible for the groceries, you probably take two to three times longer <laughs> to grocery shop and probably walk out with 500 extra dollars of stuff just because you're curious as to what you know, 500 is of course an exaggeration, but you're usually walking out with a couple of items that you've got to try just because you want to know what it's all about. So I, I love going to a show about three or four months after expo and going, yep, yep, yep. You know, just down the, like met them. Oh, saw that. Oh, that made it onto a shelf. You know, just all of that kind of stuff is fun to do. Yeah, it is fun. And I have the same problem. My partner will not go to the grocery store with me. He's <laughs> either he's like, we're in a hurry. I'm going, you're staying in the car. Or he's like, you go because you're going to take an hour. <laughs> <You're by yourself. laughs> I know. Instacart. First, I've used Instacart for almost the entirety of um, of the pandemic. And our grocery bill, I'm no joke, even with the markups of Instacart, our grocery bill has been reduced by mm. uh, probably 25% because I buy only what's on the list. Yeah. I buy almost nothing extra, you know, yeah. uh, it's very, it's so funny. So now I've started to go back into the grocery store and my husband's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. I'm going to have to take out that second mortgage again. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So tell me, so we've got this um, founders, do you have a little bit more of a founder story? Like when you talk about the brand outside, like from a consumer facing perspective, what's the language that you use to share with consumers about what this brand is all about? Um, it's funny because we we don't really have a founder story. I mean, we kind of do, but it's because right. it's an entrepreneurially founded thing. Right. You know, when, when people talk about their found up, founder story, they're right. expecting, you know, startups, yeah. bootstrapping, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, and we didn't want to, we're not, we're not trying to pretend to be something that we're not exactly. Um, So what we say, at least on the website, in terms of a founder, we're in place of a founder story. We're like, we're, we're a bunch of veggie lovers with a a big imagination, which is true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, You know, we had high hopes for veggies. We, Mm -hmm. we, and we are a bunch of veggie lovers. And internally it was a little bit of a SWAT team that started like dirt kitchen was a side gig. I, I was working on a big global innovation job at the time. And we were like, let's see if we can create a brand and validate it on e-commerce. Like mm-hmm. see if it works. Yeah. Maybe it won't work, but let's try. Yeah. And we did, and we got down the path and then that actually started the, that and, and snack futures ball was already rolling in parallel yeah. of like, you know, let's create this innovation hub and this is what we want it to look like. Mm-hmm. And then when that was moving in the right direction and Dirt Kitchen was moving in the right direction. We're like, all right, we're going to pull Dirt Kitchen into Snack Features. This makes complete, le- complete mm-hmm. sense. Well, ta- let's talk about you. We use the word um, intrapreneurial. Mm-hmm. Um, Mondelez and there's a, other cu- a couple of other multinationals. I would suspect just about everybody now has kind of an innovation team internally that is trying to duplicate or, or not duplicate, mimic how uh, these small entrepreneurial brands develop out in the real world when they're in a garage or in a basement, kind of capture some of that passion, that some of that test and learning, the trials, gut instinct approach that, you know, when you're, uh, when you're trying to enter, uh, become the next Oreo, you don't have the luxury of doing because you have uh, a lot of boxes to check, but when you're smaller, you can do things differently. So let's talk a little bit about that exercise and how you and your team are moving forward with it, at least right now. Yeah. Um, I think what's key to what you said, and, and I think what we were trying to mimic that the startups do so well is two things is 
just closeness to the consumer, like mm-hmm. really understanding the consumer, the consumer problem that you're solving, the consumer opportunity that you're going after, um, the human aspect of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like talking to real humans, going to a farmer's market with your mm-hmm. product and getting feedback that way instead of in the back room of a, of a, of a, focus group facility. Yeah. That, you know, that was the sort of closeness to the consumer that we were Mm -hmm. trying to emulate. Mm -hmm. And then the agility and the ability to move quickly in reaction to that feedback Mm -hmm. to make the changes. So those were, I think the two things for us that were most important. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because of that, we had to set ourselves up a little bit differently. Um, so Snack Futures is not part of a business unit. We're part of the global growth organization. We're kind of like over here. Mm. We've got our own um, set of resources. We leverage a lot of external resources to allow us to yeah. move quickly yeah. so that we don't have to go through, you know, it, in a normal innovation cycle from idea to commercialization could be years, right? depending on how big of an investment you need to make and, and go through all those very important processes that keep big companies from making really big mistakes, right? Yeah. Like those are there for a reason. But for us, it wasn't, we couldn't take that long because we're also trying to create the future of snacking. Right. And if you wait three years from when you have an idea to when you start selling it, then you've missed the trend. Right. Um, so we really do um, operate very differently and leverage a lot of external resources, you know, co-mans and co-packers and even external route to market right now, just to allow us to move quickly. Um, And, you know, we came to market with what we call, you know, other people call it minimally viable proposition. We call it minimally lovable proposition because it's food and it's so intimate. Like you're, you need to love it, right? People need to love your food. Um, So we came with minimally lovable proposition. There were decisions that we made um, in order to move quickly and get the consumer feedback that we wanted that I would have never made if I were right. working on one of the big brands of mm-hmm. Mondelez proper. So um, it's kind of, I, I think it's the best of both worlds a little bit because I get the experience of, yeah. of growing and the learning. I mean, I'm learning literally every day. I tell people mm-hmm. this is the most fun and the hardest job I've ever had because mm-hmm you know, we knew we needed to operate smaller. Like we were used to being up here at this big company. We knew we needed to go smaller, but we actually needed to go like way smaller. So Mm -hmm. we, there are even things we did wrong in the beginning. We're like, oh, we didn't go small enough. Um, Mm -hmm. and we're constantly adjusting. Um, so I get to really do the startup thing. Um, yet at this point we're fully funded by Mondelez International. So I don't have to worry about like fundraising and things like that, that founders need to do as they try to grow their business. Um, there may come a time where we need to do that. But at this yeah. point, we've been able to fund everything um, internally. So it's an interesting, it's a really interesting, unique opportunity. And I'm so grateful for it. Do you, have you had any moments through the process now so far where you're like, this learning that I'm having here in this moment, in this kind of, I mean, you don't have the true experience to be like literally strapped and trying to figure out, do I want to spend $12 on a box or, you know, $11 on a box, you know, like you're not fretting over that, but the other elements, are you walking out of there going, oh my gosh, you know, why aren't we doing this over here when we're working on these big giant global brands, it's like some of the thinking or processes, oh. is there any learning yeah. that you're like, this <laughs> needs to cross over? Come on. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we've actually, we've done many either like work sessions with kind of base brands or base innovation teams. They'll pull us in to be like, challenge our thinking. How, oh, how do we do this faster? Cool. Te- you know, teach us about transactional learning. What have you mm-hmm. learned? How can we apply it? We're constantly consulting to other, particularly innovation teams within Mm -hmm. the mothership as we call it, but um, yeah, a lot. And it's been, that's been fun too. I mean, I, I say a lot, like my brain's been completely rewired by this experience. Um, I just think that way now, like, how do I do this? How do I get this learning quickly? How do I do it? You know, what can we shortcut, blah, blah, blah. And it's, I almost forget that not everybody has that like muscle memory (laughs) in their brain to be able to do that. It's the Um, truth. Yeah. So yeah, it's actually really fun to be able to share that knowledge with the the broader organization. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. I love hearing that. So now going back to Dirt Kitchen specifically, as you've been working on this brand, is there a moment where you're like, 
we're headed in the right direction. And do you remember what that was? Um, there have been a lot of them, honestly. I think the way we the way we set it up, this is where I get into like marketing nerd speak a little bit. That's but, like, all right. We're good. <laughs> very much like a little bit scientific method that we applied. So okay. for each learning stage, as we were creating the brand and validating the brand and then adding, you know, adding platforms and, and tweaking positioning and stuff like that, we yeah. always came with hypotheses mm-hmm. and like what are the KPIs that we're going to read to validate mm-hmm. or invalidate that hypothesis? So we work with, you know, learning partners to help us do that. Yeah. Um, particularly with the creation of Dirt Kitchen, we worked with Spark Starter Studio, Deb Vicarelli, yeah. who was sort of the mastermind behind this way of transactional learning for us. Yeah. Um, but Deb and I would just riff together and be like, okay, what are our hypotheses? What That's experiments cool. do we need to design in order to validate or invalidate those hypotheses? And then she would lay out the learning plan and we would do them one by one. And sometimes we'd be like, all right, great. Hypothesis validated. Let's move on to the next one. Other times it would be like, oh, we were wrong. But not actually, I shouldn't even say we were wrong. Our hypothesis was not correct. Yeah. Here's the new hypothesis, or this isn't working, and here's the hypothesis for why. So now what can we go, what experiment can we do to to validate or invalidate that hypothesis? So it sort of becomes this iterative process. Yeah. Um, so there have been many, to answer your question, where we've said, yeah, okay, we're onto something. Mm-hmm. You know, the initial positioning, we did some work like workshops with consumers to kind of nail the positioning, but then we had sort yeah. of three different ways in creatively right. that we wanted to try. So we put, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of different ads into Facebook and Instagram and mm-hmm. read the data and said, okay, this one's working best. Now let's keep this constant and make this other variable and let's do it again. And okay, this one's working best. And yes, our click-through rates are actually stronger than our KPI. So that's like our top two box purchase intent of a basis. We've got purchase intent. Okay, great. Right. Now do we have purchase? Go right. on to the next bunch of experiments. So it was there were some where we were like, yeah, we're on something. Let's keep moving. And then there were some we were like, oh, Houston, we have a problem. Like something's not working. Something and, and yeah, and really early on, we had one of those actually. Um, we started our validation in Amazon. Yes. We wanted to do D to C through our own website, but we couldn't like get the back end okay. set up quickly enough. Yep. Um, yep. We were working with a partner who had a Seller Central account on Amazon. So we're like, mm-hmm. okay, we'll, we'll do it on Amazon instead. Because we didn't, you, you can do it where you, you know, you have your click through, you send them to a website, they place right. the order, and then you say, sorry, we're out of stock. We'll email you when, when we're in stock. But right. we didn't want to do that right. because we, we had product. So we're like, we want to actually be able to send them product and get sure. feedback on that too. Yeah. So we were in Amazon. We had great click through rates. And then our conversion rates are like, percent that we're buying out of the clicks was way too low, Hmm. way too low. We were like, oh no. So, you know, we could have given up at that point and said, all right, something's broken. It's not working. Instead, we said, okay, what are the hypotheses why this aren't, it's not working? Hypothesis A, it's too expensive. We had a 12 pack of single flavors at the time um, for like $25.99. Like, all right, twenty five ninety nine is a lot to ask someone to buy for twelve packs of something that they hypothesis B don't think they're going to like because right. they mm-hmm. have a healthy dose of veggie snack skepticism because mm-hmm. a lot of veggie snacks out there haven't tasted as good in the past. So, um, those were the two things. It was like price and veggie skepticism, as we called it. And so yeah. we said, how can we get over those barriers? So we quickly created, and I think my packaging team to this day would say that they have PTSD from this <laughs> because I was like, okay, we need a variety pack. And they're like, you said we weren't going to do a variety pack. I'm like, yeah, I know I changed my mind. They're like, but the packs are different sizes. I'm like, I don't care. We can still get the feedback. Like again, yeah. something we would have never done in the mothership. Um, right. Quickly put together a six, uh, six pack with three different flavors. So two mm-hmm. of each of three flavors for $14.99. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden our conversion rate skyrocketed and we started to generate what we wanted to and, and hit our KPIs. So yeah. we're like, okay, th- that was the right hypothesis. Yeah, It was too expensive and people didn't think it was yeah. going to taste good. Now we've made it cheaper and we give them the choice of three flavors. So that's become a big part of our strategy going forward yeah. is like, get, especially in D2C, yeah. get that trial pack at a price where people yes. can stomach it. Yeah. And then you know, our repeat rates, thankfully, are strong enough that they come back and buy what they like. Yeah. And we've run into that with a few of the brands that we've worked with in the past. Sahali is the one that I remember most specifically, Living Intentions as well, where, um, you know, the price per unit, the price per unit on some of these, on some of these brands is pretty high. And if you are 
um, trying something for the first time, you may not want to drop 12 bucks on it. If I don't like it, I'll feel like it's wasteful, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And um, put them in those little, I think, what is the one and a half ounce sleeves, put it up by the register, easy, quick grab for under yep. two bucks. Yep. You know, all of those things that people go, if I don't like it for two bucks, that's okay. If I like it, then I'll buy the bigger one. Um I think people yeah. forget. I think I think all brands forget that because we get really hunkered down on numbers and I need the margin and the blah blah blah. And we're like, if people don't want to try your product at that twelve dollar or seventeen dollar, even nine dollar, then it, it it doesn't it doesn't matter what your margin is. You're it's negative at that it's point. Still zero. So, yeah, <laughs> like, you got to get the food in people's faces. So yeah, take a little yeah. bit of less margin. Yep. Put it, make it more convenient, easy yeah. for people to like it and go, okay. And then, then um, move them up to the next size. So that's yep. really awesome that you guys were able to move that quickly. I think that is an opportunity that um, not a lot of brands take advantage of because they have that mentality like, you're crazy. It'll take too long. We're yep. not going to make as much money. I mean, you throw in all of the things, yeah. but as an entrepreneurial brand, you're like, yep. I don't care. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, awesome. and same. I mean, it was an even on principle, people were like, okay, yeah, we get it. But, but then somebody on the team was like, but we have, we have all this product already packed into 12 packs. I'm like, yeah, yeah but if we don't sell it, we're going to have to throw it away. So yes. let's get some people in and hand pack it into six packs that, exactly. and see what happens. And they're like, oh yeah, good point. Okay. It's going to yeah. cost money to pack it into six packs. I'm like, it's going to cost less than throwing all this product away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so I think that's great. And so, and, and all of this is now, of course, happening. You guys are getting some traction. Things are happening and, and COVID mm -hmm. kind of comes in and starts blowing the party. You know, how, yeah. how did your team take advantage of that opportunity? Is this when the whole trial packages and e com scenario came into play or was so it something else was, come in? Yeah. So the original, um, learning in, in Amazon that I just talked about was yeah. before COVID. I we had started our brick and mortar test and learn right before COVID. So that was when we brought these guys in. So we brought in the crisps, we had the veggies and nuts. They were sort of, you know, or originally not, they were like cousins and we wanted to make them siblings strategically. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so we went into a brick and mortar test and learn to put both of them on the shelf together and say, okay, is our product shelf ready? Like we validated in e-commerce, but is it going to jump off the shelf in a competitive retail environment? Right. And Different can scenario. Two, mm -hmm. Yep. And can these two things live together as a brand? So we went into about 20 store test and learn in Los Angeles and about four weeks in COVID shut everything down. So we had like four weeks of good data and then nobody was going to stores. So we're like, okay, like, did we learn what we needed to learn? Not quite yet. So we actually pivoted back to D to C. And at that point we had fixed the back end issues that um, prohibited us from doing D to C in the first place. So we're like, okay, we're going to go D to C now. Had a team put up a website. Well, we had a website, but convert it to um, an e-com site um, within a couple of weeks, get the experiments laid out and, and we pivoted big time. And mm -hmm. We were able to get through the rest of our learning, do our price testing and our some positioning testing that we wanted to do, or learning, I should call it. Um, and we got through that. So that was like, I think we turned on the site in, call it early May of 2020. We did, you know, 10 more weeks of learning and we said, okay, we're ready. We're ready to try to scale now. We made some more tweaks to product and packaging and stuff like that. So our kind of official launch, quote unquote, yeah. of of incubation mode, as we call it, was October yeah. of 2020, which, you know, still the middle of the pandemic, still right. not really easy to grow a food brand with no right. sampling. Um, and now that the world is more open, we are starting to finally get the momentum that we want to see. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a long, long road since oh, those early shutdown days, but yeah, yeah. it's, it's fun. Yeah. What do you have a milestone? Is there a moment or is there some event that you're like, I can't believe that that happened. And I'm just so proud of our team being able to get through that or, or to accomplish that. Uh, and the whole, this whole journey, honestly, I feel that way. Like the extent to which our team and our team is all people that came from, you know, the big company. Yeah. We architected snack futures 
to look the way we wanted it to look and operate the, want, the way we wanted to operate. We mm-hmm. wrote our own culture. We said, mm-hmm. this is how we want to be. Yeah. And we've lived it day in and day out for the last couple of years. And it, you know, we're all learning as we go. None of us really know what we're doing in startup world. Like none of us came from, none of us have ever worked in startups. So I'm, I feel that way every day about this mm. team. Like mm. every time, every time we do something, I'm like, this is amazing that we're a bunch of big company people figuring out how to do the startup thing. Um, <laughs> and again, like by no means has everything been perfect. There've been plenty of things that we've done where we've been like, oh, we did not do that right. Okay. Now we need to do it again and do it right. And that's fine. Like it's part of the game. Um, yeah, I mean, Expo was a, a recent example. Like we yeah. we made the call, say yes, we're going to do Expo. We're ready. We feel like the brand is at the phase where it can benefit from that time and effort and blood and sweat and tears and expense and <laughs> everything like that goes into Expo. Um, and we pulled it off, and the booth was. I was so happy with how the booth turned out. I was so happy with the traction that we got. Yes, and the feedback that we got. Um, and you guys were in like the mosh pit of the show (laughs) like for real it was crazy i mean it was yeah it was that um what was it wednesday afternoon right when the show opened yeah so you know we were along the right hand perimeter so everybody acted just like you act like in a grocery store you walk in you walk to the perimeter and you do the perimeter and that was where we were like literally there was a mosh pit outside waiting to get in at (laughs) noon on wednesday or whenever it opened and people just we were body we surfing were, even you know <laughs> like non-stop people for the yeah. first few hours we ran out of we ran out of product we ran you out of veggies and nuts after like an hour and a half and it took us a couple hours to get more to the booth because we thought we knew how to get more product to the booth and then we didn't know how to get more product to the booth and like we learned a lot we'll do better next time yeah um but yeah it was uh that was one that was like you we had people helping us and we had yep. guidance but yep. still there are things you can't learn until you've done that show and so that is the truth <laughs> and sometimes you have to do that show a few times before you really mm-hmm. kind of get the rhythm of it because it's just yeah. huge it's it's huge it's huge um, yeah, yeah, it was exhausting. I was I had like a month long introvert hangover after that show. Oh, <laughs> you it literally it took me a month seriously to be like, okay, I can talk about Expo now. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I am an extrovert. Um, like I am not on the furthest, like on a scale of one to ten, I'm at a nine point seven, and I was living my best life at Expo. I got to tell nice. you, like, and when COVID happened, my husband, who's an introvert, was like, the world has finally changed for me. <laughs> I, and I was just in tears for months because I need people. So for me, it was like, I got my, my two-year fix all at once. I, it was it was awesome. But I can imagine <laughs> for an introvert, that would be just like, help me, help yeah. me. I, I yeah. need a spa week. You know? Yeah, it was overwhelming. I, there was yeah. like day three and must have been morning of day three I think it wasn't even the end of day three some random person who came by the booth looked at me and they're like well you look really tired and I was like oh no that's not oh, good that's like if a stranger not- thinks I look tired because like I have way more energy than most people like if a stranger thinks I look tired relative to like a normal person scale I must look exhausted <laughs> oh, like that gosh. is not good let's test the um, EQ on that person <laughs> yeah no it was fine I actually appreciated it because I was just like I was delirious at that point but, oh um, my gosh yeah it was fun well, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder for you how 15 years of work experience is helping you, 15 years of multinational established big brand work is helping you or maybe hindering you or it hindered you during this process. Did you feel like you, you were walking in with your hands tied behind your back or did you feel like you had like, and can you explain that experience? Cause there's a lot of people who are like, I work for, you know, Kellogg's and I'm working on the special K brand and I want to go work for a startup. And like, you don't know what you don't know coming into Mm -hmm. an entrepreneurial world. How how did that go for you? Was it a little bit of a uh, whiplash or how would you describe that? Or was it a little bit more of an ease in because you guys kind of got to, you had the bumpers and you still had the the mothership kind of guiding you a little bit? Um. I would say it's kind of in between, like it, 
I, it was like a slow kind of rewiring is the best way that I can describe it. Like we, we went in very humble. I think Okay. we said, we don't, we don't completely know how to do this. Mm -hmm. We're going to lean on partners who can help educate us and learn together. Um, I think there are, there are things that went very smoothly and continue to go. I mean, 15 years of classical marketing training right. have equipped me quite well to be everything from the CMO to the most junior marketer on Dirt Kitchen Snack. <laughs> I do everything right now. <laughs> like I'm creating Sometimes our, simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, I'm creating our positioning and our, and our strategy and our, like the high up strategic stuff all mm-hmm. the way down to approving every single piece of copy or, mm-hmm. you know, everything that goes mm-hmm. out the door right now hopefully going to have some help soon, but, um, you know, being, having all that marketing, 15 years of marketing, um, both on the innovation and the base brand side of mm-hmm. things. Cause I'm now doing, well, I was doing more innovation as we were creating dirt kitchen. Now it's obviously more kind of what would be the equivalent of running a base brand, but all those fundamentals are there. And that's a, a you know, a skill set that I have that I'm grateful to have, um, and to be able to sort of flex between strategic and, and execution. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's all very easy. And, you know, and then there are harder things like on the sales side of things. I mean, snack futures was set up to be an innovation hub. We didn't bring in sales in the beginning. We didn't have a sales person. We still don't have, we don't have a sales headcount internally. So we've had to bring in external folks to be sales for us. Uh Uh-huh. That is very much like a startup brand. Yeah. That was a big learning that I had early. You know, I was meeting with um, one of the startups from our collab program last summer. And he's like, um, first of all, you're a first time founder. You don't know what you're doing. I was like, that is very true. Very true. Um, He's like, I'm a second time founder. And I learned a whole lot the first time that you can only learn by doing this. I'm like, yes, "Yes, I agree. And then secondly, he's like, you guys need sales. Like you need salespeople. And we're like, oh, yes, we need salespeople. Oh, that thing. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And then... um, you know, people that know the market, that know the yeah. retail landscape. And yes, yeah. we bring in brokers, but you still need an internal sales expertise mm-hmm. to help mm-hmm. you manage that. Um, so that was like a big thing that we learned. Like, oh yeah, we don't know what we're doing on the sales side of things. You know, even creating our initial financial forecast, again, we we knew to go small, but we yeah. didn't go small enough. We're, yeah. we're like, oh yeah, we'll get into a thousand stores. We'll get two, 250 stores and then a thousand stores. And then I was read something pretty early on in that journey, I was like, oh God, that's not what we should be doing. (laughs) We need to scale more slowly. We need to grow velocity and distribution at the same time. Velocity Um, before distribution. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and what I love so much about Snap Futures and about our team and about Bridget as a leader of our team is that, A, I was comfortable to raise my hand and be like, we need to stop what we're doing. We're doing this wrong. Like, stop. We need to pivot. That's awesome. And she was receptive to, yes, okay, Mm -hmm. that makes sense. I'm like, read this book. I read this book. Read this book. And we both read it over the course of a weekend. And then we talked about it. And we're like, oh, yeah, we're doing this wrong. Um, So it's been, again, like, I think we approached it in a very humble way. But knowing we had a lot to learn, embracing that learning, embracing the pivots when we needed to. Um, And yeah, it's been... uh, I'm, I'm still learning. I mean, that, that there'll be something I learned tomorrow that I'm like, oh, I've been doing that wrong too. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you have to be able to kind of stomach yeah. that stuff, I think, to make a pivot, like going from like big food to going to this startup yeah. world. Yeah. I'm going to take a break here real quick. Um, we're up on the hour. I, I'm thinking we have maybe seven more minutes. Are you good? Mm-hmm. Hang on. Let me just make sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure I blocked right after this so that I wouldn't be late for something. Hang on. Come on, come on, calendar. You're good. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay, good. Okay. So, uh, so then this leads me to my next question, right? Um, what advice would you give somebody? Because you said something. First, I'm going to start with this. You said something about you came into this humbly, and I want to just kind of emphasize this. We've worked with a number of founder owner brands that will say, "Hey, we've just brought in this." safety person, innovation person, this marketer, the COO that comes from insert multinational, they are going to solve all our problems. And these people come in a little bit with a little white knight cape on, and it ends up being a little bit not what anybody expects, because Mm -hmm. they're two completely two different cultures. So I want to say, 
brilliant that you guys knew to do that. But when you are talking to other people that might want to enter into a venture similar to yours, or even just kind of literally moving into an entrepreneurial brand, what advice are you, are you giving these folks? Just be, have a learning mindset, Mm -hmm. I think is, is the most important thing. Like, no, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and just always be embracing the learning and the opportunity. Um, and, and that's where I think leveraging the network can help a lot. And this yeah. is something I need to remind, my, remind myself constantly. Um, I love going to places like Expo or Nosh yes. or, you know, meeting other founders, mm-hmm. actually entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. entrepreneurial founders versus mm-hmm. entrepreneurial founders, like people that are walking the walk doing what we're doing, Mm -hmm. um, building those relationships and being able to bounce ideas off of people and just brainstorm together. You know, I think every startup, and we see this right now with our collab cohort, um, 10 phenomenal startups that are in our collab program right now, all mission-oriented brands are so cool. Um, You know, we had our midpoint workshop a couple of weeks ago and it was in person and it was not a super packed agenda intentionally to leave time for people to like bond and, you know, just chat. And, you know, I met with my buddy yesterday and she's like, we ended up mostly talking about our businesses versus like, you know, other stuff, social, whatever, but it's so cool. Cause we're all kind of going through the same growing pain. So we're able to actually bounce ideas off each other. And that's what that's for. Right. So even mm-hmm. for me being an entrepreneur, remembering sometimes that I have that network of actual startups that I've been building and, you know, being able to ask people for advice or bounce things off of people and stuff like that. Um, or ask them, you know, when you were facing this challenge, how did you attack it? Stuff like that, I think is, is really important. Just again, like be humble, have a learning mindset, um, be open, be open to pivoting constantly don't take it personally when something isn't going the way you think it should. Yes. The way you think it should is based on big company world, not little company world. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and be ready to work harder than you've probably ever worked in your entire life. Yeah. I've worked pretty hard in my life. So <laughs> it's just like a I different know. kind of hard work. It's fun, but it's really hard. Yes. I, I can uh, absolutely imagine. Wow. Okay. So what's next for Dirt Kitchen? Um, hopefully continuing to grow and grow and grow and grow. I mean, we want the Sprouts program to go well. Obviously, if any of you listening to this podcast live near Sprouts, please go check out their kitchen snacks on the innovation displays. Love your feedback too. Um, hopefully that goes well and we get to land on the shelf. That will be an absolute step change um, yes. in terms of the scale of our business. That'll open up a lot of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um and we brought, we just um, started working with Green Spoon as a broker. And so that's opening up a lot of opportunity as Excellent. well. It's been, they're phenomenal. Um, it's so much fun. Um, again, really hard. <laughs> like it's like constantly like, they're like, I need a deck for this presentation. I need samples for oh, that fire. And it's I awesome because this is what we want, right? Right. want to get the brand in front of the right people. Um, so our goal is to be a hundred million dollar veggie snacking brand. Um we know that's going to take way longer than a hundred million dollar bread would take in the mothership because that's how the startup life is. But um, that's our goal. So but you'd growing. be surprised. You could yeah. probably do that. I mean, it's, certainly you could not do that with uh, like a, a mothership brand one, but you know, three to four years is really incredibly fast, but completely doable. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that feels really fast. It's funny. I know it feels really fast. Friends, you're like, how long did it take you to get to this point? They're like 15 years. We're like, okay. Oh, we got no. A long road ahead of us. No, but, um, we've, we've built a few brands that have gone from two to over a hundred million in, in four years. Nice. So it's possible. Awesome. You can do it. You can do it. I know you can do it. It's p- very possible. Oh my goodness. Well, Katrina, I have really enjoyed this second conversation. With <laughs> Take two. <laughs> uh, our time is almost up. There's a couple of questions I like to ask everybody uh, before I wrap up. So the first one is kind of like um, happy hour tip. I don't know. Feedback, insight, it, um, anything about the product that you're working in or even about Mondelez that, you know, there's 1 million Oreos eaten every single day or something like that. Um have anything you want to share with the audience? A fun fact? Yeah, fun fact or interesting um, fact. 
Mm -hmm. You caught me off guard on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, A fun fact that I would share is that, um, well, I already used my 91% of Americans want to eat more veggies. That's the one I usually use. That's the one then. There you go. Okay. Yeah. 91% of American adults are trying to get more veggies into their life. 91% want more? That want want to eat more veggies. Yeah. But only 10% actually do eat enough veggies, according to the CDC. Hmm. So we all got to eat our veggies. Eat I'm also wearing veggies. my veggies you dig shirt. I know a lot of this is audio, but like yes. we, we, love, we love veggies in Dirt Kitchen. We love veggie puns. So yeah, <laughs> veggies, all about the veggies. Uh, all about the veggies. <laughs> okay. Are there any women, other women leaders out there, or rising stars that you would like to elevate for the uh, work that they're doing right now? And if so, who are they and, and yeah. why? Yeah, I'm actually going to um, give a shout out to my collab buddies. So I'm working with uh, buddying with Moonshot okay. um, and the founder, Julia Collins, who actually has not one but two startups that she's running. So Moonshot and then Planet Forward. And they are all okay. about carbon neutral, environmentally sustainable snacking. Love um it. So I don't know how she does two startups when I can barely do one. All right. Um, and then Haley Brown, who's the marketer for Moonshot, who's kind of my day-to-day contact who I've been buddying with. So yes. that is who I will give a shout out to because okay. they're amazing. They're doing amazing sustainability work with their awesome little brand. Excellent. I'll have to check them out a little bit more. I, I love that. Okay. Well, we've been talking with Katrina Borschuk, Senior Director of Snack Futures and Dirt kitchen snacks brand lead katrina if people want to learn more about you or mondelez or dirt kitchen where where do they go um lots of places so me i guess linkedin is probably your best bet um Mm -hmm. finally updated my linkedin profile during covid nice job um yeah (laughs) um dirt kitchen snacks our website is dirtkitchensnacks.com or you can follow us on social media please do um, we're on Instagram and Facebook and, um, Mondelez, obviously, you know, Google the big corporate site, Mondelez snack futures. We also have a snack futures webpage. If you want to learn more about what we're doing at snack futures or our collab program. Um, that is all on the snack futures website. All right. And remind Did us for everything. <laughs> well, yeah. What regions is dirt kitchen in right now? So we have a lot of distribution in Southern California okay. and many retailers, um, Erwan, Lassen's, Bristol Farms, Gelson's, some Ralph stores, more to come. Um, and then we're in Sprouts nationally. So all National. 380 Sprouts stores. Excellent. Yep. And then we're working on expanding up the West Coast right now, San Francisco Bay Area, Sacramento Area, and then up to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, that better happen sooner than later, sister. I'm in the Pacific know, Northwest. So. We cannot be last on the list. Cannot have that. We'll not be last on the list. I'm getting <laughs> lots of Green Spoon emails every day of them presenting to lots of stuff in your hood. So I'll excellent, let you know. <laughs> excellent. Well, I, thank you again for your time today. I am so happy to have spent this time with you, and I love even just in the last month, just like an entrepreneurial brand, seeing the progress that you guys are making. And I want to thank all of you listeners for your time today. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day and we'll catch you next time on The Gooder Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe and share with your network. Until next time, be well and do gooder. Gooder.